President Trump wrapping up a big rally in Tampa, Florida, where he spoke in support of Republican gubernatorial candidate Congressman Ron DeSantis, the president playing to the crowd and performing his greatest hits, boasting about the economy and low unemployment numbers, taking shots at the fake news media and Democrats, and even doing a little stand-up. FBN's Edward Lawrence is at the White House waiting the president's return. He is here with details. Fast Eddie, what's going on? Yeah, exactly, Kennedy. Uh, we were waiting for a campaign rally to promote Ron DeSantis, and we got a little bit of comedy, a little bit of everything, actually. The president told voters to elect Governor Rick Scott to the U.S. Senate in that state. He wasted no time talking about the economic numbers, saying the economy grew at 4.1 percent. He touted how many jobs have been created since he's become president. The president also saying that other presidents allowed the U.S. to get ripped off and didn't follow through with good trade deals. Now that we have the best economy in the history of our country, this is the time to straighten out the worst trade deals ever made by any country on earth. They are the worst. For decades, the United States was the piggy bank that everybody was robbing. And the president says that because of the steel tariffs, steel workers are going back to job or getting jobs, going back to work. The president, this is a very pro-American speech is that he gave. He did say the Democrats want to raise taxes and hurt jobs. The days of plundering American jobs and American wealth, those days are over. They're over. America first. America first. We're also living by two very important rules. Buy American and hire American. And we also called for voter identification laws. Now, at one point, the president off script even mocked the fact that he doesn't always act presidential. Watch this. Ladies and gentlemen of the state of Florida. Thank you very much for being here. You are tremendous people. And I will leave now because I am boring you to death. Thank you. And the president loves this kind of rally. He spoke for more than an hour and 20 minutes. Kennedy? That was all real. He's our <laughs> president, Edward. And genuine, and very genuine. Very that, genuine. that is true Donald Trump right there. Uh, he was in his genre. Uh, he loves speaking to a crowd mm -hmm. that chants USA, that chants Make America Great Again. He loves that atmosphere. Those white and red hats. It was a sea of them. Yeah. And he, uh, he drowned in the applause and loved every moment. Don't send him a life preserver. Edward Lawrence, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. The president also continued to beat the drama of immigration and echoed his calls to secure the southern border. We're going to have tremendous border security that will include the wall. That will include the wall. Now, a lot of people don't know it, but we've already started the wall. We got $1.6 billion, and we've started large portions of the wall. But we're going to need, even the way we negotiate, we're going to need more, and we're going to get more. And we may have to do some pretty drastic things, but we're going to get it. Of course, those drastic things are a reference to his recent threat to shut down the government if he doesn't get wall funding from Congress. But according to the Wall Street Journal, the president has privately agreed to hold off on a potential shutdown until after the midterms, because doing so could help Republicans politically in November. So will the president have the patience to wait for the wall? Let me ask Fox News politics editor Chris Steyerwalt. Chris, I, I need you to peer into the president's <laughs> brain. I need you to feel his whims and forecast what he might do in the short and long term on this most critical issue. If there is one thing that he has promised, it is the wall. Well, yes, but what's a wall and how big and how long and how soon? Particulars, uh, Chris. And in, and in the case of the wall, those particulars have shifted. Uh, now, for this president, he is keenly aware that his 2020 hopes rest on a supercharged, hyper-energized base. Mm. He has never had majority support, but what he has had from the beginning of his Republican presidential uh, primary run through his November victory in 2016, and even till today, is a third or more of the country that is rock-solid behind him. Yes. And he is counting on that. So...
he is dancing through this little minefield here because he knows that when it comes time before the end of the federal fiscal year to punt again on spending, when they so do, there will be a hue and cry that rises up from his base supporters that say, you've betrayed the hope we were supposed to build the wall. Why didn't you shut down the government to get more wall funding? So I think what the president's doing here is a little bit of a rope-a-dope. He says, I'm going to shut down the government. I'm not afraid to shut down the government. I'm not afraid to shut down the government. Provides a little cover for Mitch McConnell to carry teaspoons of budget funding across uh, the Sahara here mm. to get the job done. And then they say, of course, at the end, well, what we meant all along was in December in the lame duck session, not now. Maybe. But I will tell you this, they're not teaspoons, it's a fire hose. I mean, that last omnibus bill, it was an embarrassment. It was an abomination. And anyone who considers themselves to be a limited government, cost-cutting conservative, they should be hanging their heads in shame. They should have all quit en masse, but of course they didn't and they won't. Uh, the president is entitled to his florid rhetoric, and I appreciate it because these nights are very entertaining, if nothing else. Now, of course, he needs that base. Uh, but the problem is, if the base hears how well the economy is doing, how well we are doing across the pond uh, and all corners of this round globe, which really doesn't have any quarters <laughs> if you uh, discount Euclid, St and I think we should, Stipulate. I think they're going to be sick of winning. And, and the problem is, if you keep having rallies and, and people are so satiated with this great economy, they may not be passionate to go out and vote. But remember, what they're going to the rallies for is, yes, the love, but it's also for the hate. Uh, it's to hate the journalists. It's to hate uh, Democrats. It's the hate. That is, a, and fear also, and fear that also that this menace from south of the border will come, that the scourge of all of these things are coming for them. That's a huge part of this. And what you will see the president do as we get closer to the election is m ramping up more of the fear and more of the anger mm -hmm. as you get closer to motivate base voters to say, look, you may, you, we may be doing fine, but we have not yet destroyed the threats to making America great again. And I think you'll hear more and more of that. Yeah. And the only way to destroy them, to eradicate them, is to keep them from catapulting into this country by building a wall so high and so beautiful that none of the bad people can come in, but there will be a beautiful door where the great ones can legally leak through the sieve, sir. Something like that. Indeed. Something like that. Chris Dyerwalt, we're on at nine, which means that I'm feeling fine, and I appreciate your time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, the president tonight pushing hard, both on immigration and the economy, which issue is going to be more important for Republicans heading into the 2018 midterms. Well, let me go to tonight's panel for so much more. He's from Freethink Media, where he is a partner and host of the podcast The Fifth Column. Camille Foster is here. We've got Washington Times opinion editor and Fox News contributor Charles Hurt and the host of The Richard Fowler Show. We actually got Richard Fowler. He is here, also a Fox News contributor. Welcome, everyone. Good to be Thanks here. Having um, so what's more important to the base and to voters who will keep Republicans in power? Is it immigration or the economy? Well, I think for Trump's base, it's going to be um, immigration. But I think if you're looking at the larger map and where Republicans have to win to maintain the House of Representatives, it's going to be both of these issues. And I think with that being said, I, I think for, for Republicans, it seems as though the House is probably out of reach for them already. Um, think about Thinking about if he decides to shut the government down, mm -hmm. they're going to lose seats like Barbara Comstock. I know, but I, I, hear, I hear stories all over the place. I hear the DNC has no money, very little cash on hand, but, but then I hear the DCCC has a bunch of money and these races are, are well funded. I hear that on the generic ballot, uh, Democrats keep uh, losing it and their poll numbers keep going down on this generic ballot. So what you, well, I mean, what you want to have is you want to have uh, over 8% of the generic ballot on average to take the House back, right, which is what usually, that's what the Republicans had in 2010. You know, not long ago, Democrats had plus 16. Right now, they're, but they're just over. All, if you take the average of the polls, they're mm -hmm. just about eight percent. If you look at the individual races that we're talking about, picking mm -hmm. up seats, it looks like Democrats will have enough to win there. And look at it this way: I mean, if, if Democrats are having a really good night in election in November, we'll pick up a Senate seat in Tennessee or they, Marsha Blackburn. But we don't know what's going to happen, Charles Hurt, and and that's the thing. And both sides have to be very careful uh, to make sure that their rabid voters are not apathetic. And it seems there's a little bit more anger and resistance and passion in that regard on the Democrat side. Sure, certainly. So what can Republicans it, 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 do to fan the flames of their... 
<laughs> well, I think that uh, that's why the issue of uh, illegal immigration is so important right now, and uh, and that's why Trump is is talking about it. But one of the things I think is uh, particularly interesting about this is that you know you cited the Wall Street Journal reporting that um, that uh, Republicans in Congress have talked Trump into. Uh, sort of letting this holding get, off on the yeah, shutdown right. is yeah. that a good idea to hold off on the shutdown? I don't know that it is because uh, Democrats and Republic everybody in Washington loves to talk about how disastrous shutdowns are for Republicans. This is because uh, Republicans lose every fight where there's an argument involved. Uh, it's just sort of in their DNA. And uh, so they always lose the fight and they get blamed for every shutdown. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and you look at shutdowns, they never, Republicans never get punished uh, over a shutdown. It, the, the last big one we had was in two, 2013. What happened in 2014? Republicans, uh, they got, got fully the blamed the for Senate. it. They, won, they got a majority in the Senate and they got an historic majority in the House. And then what happened four years after, uh, two years after that? They won the White House. Mm. So this whole canard filthy canard mm. about how Democrats always win or and Republicans always get pay a price yep. for That's, uh, is BS. Canard is duck. In, right, in and, uh, but also a lie, a mm -hmm. filthy lie or a filthy duck. Because ducks are filthy. liars. Huh, uh, lying, filthy. Camille, I, I share your love of this country, and I want the economy to do well. I want people to make money because capitalism lifts people out of poverty. We know that. Excellent. Uh, we know that the tax cuts are great because people deserve more of their own money because taxation is theft. Mm -hmm. But so is overspending. Yeah, it would be better if we were cutting the budget as well and certainly wasting a bunch of money on but a But now wall we're on a fast track to another one of these panic measures. Yeah, that would be nice to, to sort of get things figured out. The, the one thing that I find very interesting about this conversation about shutting down the government is, is why isn't he trying to shut down the Mexican government? Mm. Weren't they supposed to be paying for this wall? We seem to have forgotten that. Um, instead, we have, are facing the prospect yeah. of demanding money from the U.S. taxpayers to pay for this wall, which the Mexicans were supposed to be paying for. Pony up, AMLO. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, mean, that's, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't have a problem that with that. A, not that I think that's a better idea. Um, I just think it's, it's, what, it's worth noting when the president shifts gears yeah. and simply changes the narrative seamlessly and certainly, certainly should not be let off the hook for that. No, and, and he's an anti-politician, but sometimes very much behaves like any other politician. Sure. Because that's how they become politicians. They're they're attracted to the swamp. Absolutely. Like magpies and Creatures car crash. of the swamp. That's right. Well, is the Kremlin, we're, we're going to shift a little bit here, is the Kremlin ramping up their get-out-the-vote operation for the midterms? The short answer is we don't really know, but we can tell you Facebook has uncovered sophisticated efforts to influence American politics, and they've since removed 32 holy underwear fake accounts. The company hasn't confirmed if they were in fact linked to Russia, but the top Democrat in the Senate Intelligence Committee, he's not waiting for the facts. Mark Warner says today's disclosure is, quote, further evidence that the Kremlin continues to exploit platforms like Facebook to sow division and spread disinformation. So is Putin up to his old tricks or could somebody else be giving him a run for his rubles? Why wouldn't every other government that distrusts us try and do this exact same thing? Listen, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the Russians or not, but I think I'm happy that Facebook has finally got their act together and they're finally saying, "Listen, we're on it, and we now we're working with the DOJ, mm -hmm. we're working with Homeland Security to get it done, and we're informing the American people this is amazing." Now, what we need is for our Congress to get their act together and pass some laws to fortify our vote. Maybe we should just go back to paper ballots, right, where there's not a computer, there's not a machine. People go in, they bubble, and it's humanly oh, counted. Oh, you want more dangling chads? No, not no. I've said people bubble, not dangling. <laughs> has not poking but literally you bubble with the pencil and some that's not a reference it. from magic mike either because i don't I know think, if a lot of people want to get in the 2000 way back machine but, but i'm just saying i mean there. i think we've got to fortify our elections and i wish congress would stop but having not, hearings I mean, but it's not and do it's, it's not just going back to the shire uh, you know, we well, however we want to, for, I'm just saying, however I, we need to fortify, let's fortify. Right now, it's just a lot of hearings and a lot of talk. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, again, 32 accounts thrown off of the Internet. Let's let's keep in mind what we were talking about before with the, the last revelations from Facebook. $100,000 in advertising spending by these groups. Um, I don't care how many times people see those ads that are spelled with broken English by people who obviously don't speak English as a first language, who post images of Hillary Clinton fighting Satan. The absurd, <laughs> hysterical, ridiculous notion that Facebook posts from the Russians help turn the election yeah, is so but I think it's ridiculous. Beyond that. Our, our, no, no, it's not beyond that. It's the if fact that they also try to hack vote, they from, tried to hack voting machines in yeah, various states. This is an impossibility, a total impossibility. But I don't like the attempt of them trying, yeah, and we they, need to make sure they, they, they don't. They may try to do any okay, number of 
things. We said here's, we don't need to thing, move the paper like, ballot. I don't, I don't trust Russia, but also I don't trust anyone. I mean, I'm a natural skeptic, and I think China could be doing this. North I don't care Korea, who's doing it. I just think that I'll our machine say, I be said it before. I'll say it again. Burma. Charles Hurt, take the football well, and run, my well, friend. Well, you know, this is the problem with free speech, is that uh, you get a lot of loud voices. Do people like you me get, get shows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yep. there's that, there's you're, you're that. Not free. and then people like me get invited on them, which is, uh, and, but then, you know, people get to say whatever they want to say, and, and, and you don't know who's saying it, and all this kind of stuff. Look, this is a farce. I mean, the, the whole Facebook thing, totally. they're with 32 uh, whatever accounts. How many accounts do they have? I think that, like, you know, my dad has, like, 35 yeah. himself. I he love that your dad has thing. these phony yeah. accounts. Oh, no, he's a lurker. <laughs> and uh, that, did I see him outside my apartment the other night? Quite possibly. I thought you weren't supposed to use binoculars in New York. Quite possibly, yeah. but uh, yeah. So this is just it's a it's a farce. The whole thing is ridiculous, and they're just trying to like sort of. Well, we and it's don't know it was Russia. We know they threw off a bunch of but, fake accounts. But, but this is and this is the problem that they've gotten into by calling themselves media companies. If they just called themselves free speech platforms, mm. they would be a lot better off. Than having to defend, who cares if they have fake news on there? It's if it's a free speech platform, you I can't. I don't you, think that you, would I be think, much about I think we should do something like the Purge oh, and no, have no, fake this. news <laughs> week, where everyone just puts out <laughs> fake news, be like shark and news we get it all shark out of our system, <laughs> we and get, then we'll see if, if culturally we survive at the end, because perhaps we will not. The panel will, and they're returning in just a little bit. First up, however, new evidence shows North Korea developing new missiles less than two months after Kim Jong Un pledged to denuclearize. Can the North be trusted? And what do we do if they go back on their word? They wouldn't. I'm going to ask New York Congressman Lee Zeldin. He joins me next. Welcome back. U.S. intelligence officials have confirmed to Fox News that North Korea is, in fact, continuing to work on its missile program. We'll talk about Indian giving. Despite promises to denuclearize and analysis, Satellite photos indicate activity at a factory in North Korea, which builds long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of targeting us here in these United States. Last week on Capitol Hill, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo remained optimistic about North Korea keeping the pledge made during that June 12th summit. Watch. President Trump remains upbeat about the prospects for North Korean denuclearization. Progress is happening. We need Chairman Kim Jong-un to follow through on his commitments that he made in Singapore. Well... Now it appears the North Korean leader is not following through, so how should the president respond? How should John Bolton respond? How does John Bolton want to respond? Let me ask New York Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin. He's also a member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Welcome back to the show, sir. Happy to be back. So do you believe that the North Koreans have uh, kick-started their nuke program once again? I'm seeing a mixed bag. You get some reports that will come back where, as you were just talking about, missile uh, testing that development site. Uh, but then you also at the same time are hearing reports about another site where uh, Kim Jong-un had pledged to uh, be breaking down that other site. And it seems like he's following through on that. Yeah. Uh, you get a mixed bag where uh, we have the remains of 55 uh, hopefully, American service members uh, now. We don't even know. I mean, that, that's. I'm so remains. glad you brought that up because we don't know if those are remains of U.S. Uh, soldiers and Marines who died on the battlefield uh, fighting the Korean War, or if, in fact, these are some of our allies. If that. Well, the good news. Yeah, I, so, so true. Uh, the good news is uh, advancements of technology just over the course of the last decade and a half, uh, even with a bone. Uh, it is so much easier to be able to figure out uh, who that bo that bone belongs to. So uh, it hopefully won't take too long of a time to be able to identify. It's possible that you, know, you might find a, a, a one of the boxes might be uh, yeah. from Australia. Yes, uh, that's, another that's, bone might be from. That's very true. We we yes. don't know, and it, it will be hard to assemble all of the potential DNA profiles. Um, so should we bomb them? What's that, Kennedy? Should we bomb North Korea? Oh no! I uh, I, I, I think that Good would answer. be a, a a very bad um, option, uh, the last possible option. And I'll tell you, I mean, though, if you look at where we were a year ago mm -hmm. and where we are today, I mean, last year it wasn't a mixed bag; it was all bad. Fast forward to now, you're getting this, you're getting good news and bad news. But I mean, just look over the course of the last year, we've come a long way. That's right, baby. 
All right, I want to switch gears a little bit, and I'm not happy about this. Yesterday, we learned that Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan will cost a whopping $32 trillion over the course of 10 years. Uh, this is from two ideologically opposed organizations come up with the same numbers. Uh, has the Republicans' failure to fix health care given traction to the left, the ultra-left progressives' push for socialized medicine? And does your party have any plan at all whatsoever to stop it? Well, first off, I'll say, you know, my district, we don't want a government-controlled, one-size-fits-all takeover of health care. Uh, and we also don't want to see the, the cost that would come with imposing Medicare for all. If you doubled all of the individual and corporate taxes, uh, that study says you still wouldn't have enough in order to pay for this. We don't want to have to wait months for a routine checkup. Uh, we do want to pick our doctor. We do want to have options when you have I know, different but, but ways to Republicans treat a condition to be able to treat it. Republicans blew it on health care. That's the problem. Congressional Republicans blew it on health care. Is there a plan to fix it so we don't end up with this nonsense now that polling is over 50% for socialized medicine somehow? So uh, the good news is, I mean, the president has signed about 10 bills uh, health care related since he's come into office. He's taken some administrative action. He had some progress here in recent weeks as it, as it relates to prescription drug prices and getting uh, certain pharmaceutical companies to agree to holding the line. There are dozens, I mean, several dozen other bills that have passed the House that are over in the Senate. We just passed the medical device elimination uh, legislation. We came together and the president signed the FDA Modernization Act to bring certain drugs uh, to market faster at less cost. Uh, but, you know, w w you have to understand, I mean, you understand this, but you need 218 votes in the House, yeah. but you also need 60 votes in the Senate. I know, but you're, so you're talking in order to get about Band-Aids, sir, and the patient is hemorrhaging, unfortunately. It's a very critical, dire situation, so I hope we have a free market solution in the wings. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's great to see you. That's right. President Trump attacking the Koch brothers on Twitter today, calling them a joke. But should President Trump take some of their ideas on trade and immigration seriously? My monologue and reaction from the panel. That's next. Oh, the president. He's at his best when he's deregulatory, funny, and unashamedly charming. He's at his worst when he's thin-skinned and impulsively reactionary, lashing back with crushing force at a perceived enemy. And today it was Charles and David Koch, as the president tweeted, quote, The globalist Koch brothers who have become a total joke in real Republican circles are against strong borders and powerful trade. I never sought their support because I don't need their money or bad ideas. They love my tax and regulation cuts, judicial picks, and more. I made them richer. Their network is highly overrated. I have beaten them at every turn. They want to protect their companies outside the U.S. from being taxed. I'm for America first and the American worker, a puppet for no one. Two nice guys with bad ideas make America great again. Now, of course, when the Cokes were effusively praising the president for his tax cuts and SCOTUS pick, they were so hot and close it was practically a three-way in a jacuzzi. Mm. The president is not only critical of the Koch's long-standing support of free trade and increased legal immigration, he's also bent out of shape because they're withholding their piggy bank pennies from Senate hopeful Kevin Kramer, who wants to unseat troubled Democrat Heidi Heitkamp. Kramer has been stroking the president with all appendages on his misguided tariff jags, which runs contrary to the Koch's mission to bring down economic and geographic barriers that keep people poor. Kevin Kramer wants his own big fun rally, but he won't have the Koch's yummy slush fun to send Heitkamp back to band camp when she loses in November. The president sounds exactly like Bernie Sanders when he irrationally demonizes the Koch brothers and idolizes tariffs and protectionism. If he embraced his fickle free market whims, he could save his energy to fight the real enemy, statist socialists who want to bring down the entire system so the government can run your life and force you into an early grave. Socialism is the worst bad idea of all. And that's the memo. President Trump has pushed a hardline stance on immigration and protectionist economic policies since he entered office and long before. So has the influence of liber liberty-minded individuals like the Koch brothers decreased in the GOP? My panel is back. Charlie Hurt, Richard Fowler, and Camille Foster. Uh, Camille, 
Hashtag Camille 2020. Um, I will start with you. There's a lot of talk. Uh, people would like you to run for president on the libertarian side. They know that you are consistent and liberty-minded. Yes. Um, the Republican Party used to be quite consistent mm -hmm. on limiting the size of government mm -hmm. and increasing free trade. They Obviously, used to talk about that. So they, were they used to talk about consistent. that. Uh, but but now there have been uh, a lot of 180s. Yeah. You know, so much so that there's a little bit of political whiplash. Uh -huh. um, can those who are in favor of free trade and increased legal immigration and the president come together and, and find common ground? I'm not so sure. I don't think, I mean, as you mentioned, this is the one place where the president has been just ruthlessly consistent mm -hmm. long before he showed any interest in getting into, in, into national politics. Yes. Um, I, I don't think he changes on this. He doesn't understand these issues. He does not appreciate just how destructive these tariffs and trade wars can be. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand understand just how destructive it can be to, yes, cut taxes and reduce, reduce the federal take. But if you don't do something about spending, you are actually making things materially worse. Um, and, and I just don't see any sort of fiscal restraint. And I don't see anything like the, the sort of conservative more. No, and, and spending to leads to borrowing. And at some point, that Absolutely. bill is going to come and we are going to be in a heap of deep yogurt. Absolutely. Um, so are the Koch brothers globalist jokes as the president? Well, the president is very smart about uh, defining himself by his enemies, and, and he does it when we love it, when he uh, goes after the media or the New York Times or whatever, uh, and then, and then uh, he does it when he goes after people like the Kochs, who are uh, certainly on the left pretty unpopular, um, unfairly so, I would argue. Um, but it, it burnishes his ability to say things like, my only special interest is you, the American people. Mm -hmm. um, he's a puppet for no one. But, you know, the problem, I, I, I keep going back to the Republicans. Um, you're right about uh, what Republicans are speaking My dad being so concerned about that, he was so concerned that George W. Bush, not only yep. Medicare Part D, which he found very problematic, but George W. Bush would not veto any spending legislation. No. He wouldn't veto anything. That's because, and that's because Republicans were in Congress. Yeah. And of course, whatever you think about, just fast forward to a very important thing, you know, whatever you think about um, Donald Trump, at least there are, there's, there's real ad adversity, uh, ad, you know, between um, Republicans on the Hill mm -hmm. and the White House, Republicans in the White House, I think that's a positive step. But my only point is... Uh, i got to get Richard in, so we got to wrap it up, baby. Right, go ahead. No, okay. uh, I mean, there might be adversity. <laughs> there, I mean, there were some great points in there. I, I, it was there, masterful. There might be adversity, but he signs every spending bill that crosses his desk. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, here's the, here's the thing, and I think, I don't agree with the Koch brothers on much, but I, when you look, when it comes to the positives, I do agree with them on with criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. how we deal with opioids, how we deal with legalization or, or decriminalization of drugs, mm -hmm. and I think the White House is on the opposite side on all of those issues. Mm -hmm. They believe the way to deal with opioids is through enforcement and not through dealing with you the public health. You wouldn't know that because your friends on the left demonize them so much. You wouldn't know no, I mean, that, that, that they I, I have think, a very wide liberty streak when it comes to some... I, I get all of that, but I think this is, in here lies a problem, and I think to bring it back to what we started this conversation about the midterm elections, mm -hmm. what President Trump forgets is that before he got there, the reason why he was even elected president, the reason why you have precinct captains in all these small towns all across the country, is because of the Koch's money, whether you like it or not. So bashing the hand that feeds you mm -hmm. is stupid and it's ridiculous and it's probably going to cost you in the midterm. Well, I love the ballet and, uh, and they are patrons of the arts, particularly David Koch. Uh, thank you very much. It, you. It's nice to see you, Richard Charles and Camille Foster. Wow. President Trump's war of words with the media. Well, that hasn't slowed down. He tweeted this morning, quote, the fake news media is going crazy. They are totally unhinged in many ways after witnessing, witnessing firsthand the damage they do to so many innocent and decent people. I enjoy watching. In seven years, when I'm no longer in office, their ratings will dry up and they will be gone. But have presidents and the media ever gotten along? Let me ask presidential historian and author of Game of Thorns. Doug Weed is back. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks, Kennedy. <laughs> uh, so this is interesting, and the tension between the president and the media goes back all the way to George Washington, doesn't it? <laughs> it's awful. Washington's cabinet was just ripped apart. They accused Hamilton of... Uh, infidelity and there was blackmail involved and it was true and they <laughs> accused Thomas Jefferson of having sex with an underage slave and fathering children nobody oh. believed it it was true <laughs> and then John Quincy Adams they were so angry the media with him the corrupt bargain he had been chosen in the House of Representatives they went after his family his son committed suicide the first lady Louisa wrote in her diary another child offered up on the altar of politics mm. 
And then Andrew Jackson, he tried to protect his wife. The media went after her, accused her of adultery, bigamy. She was a very devout woman. All that was hidden from her till Jackson won the election. She went shopping with her girlfriends in Nashville to buy an inaugural dress, read the old newspapers, had a stroke, died, never went to Washington, never wore wow. the dress. I could go on and on. It no, it's, it's unbelievable. So, but you know, this this is nothing new. The way the president feels targeted, it, it may feel like he's isolated and alone. But in fact, uh, 38 news organizations had to sue the Obama administration uh, for more transparency and for FOIA requests. Yeah, and uh, 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 Donald Trump was opposed by 419 newspaper endorsements. He got 12 to 15 newspaper endorsements, so it's pretty heavy against him. Dwight Eisenhower, who warned us about the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. also warned us about the danger of the network news media and, uh, and uh, monopolizing the news. His uh, press secretary, James Haggerty, said, these are great men, Paley, Sarnoff, the pioneers of networking news. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower said, no, we should trust, I'm an old army man, let's trust good systems. You have two people count the church offering, not because they're untrustworthy, but an honest man wants someone else in the room. So Eisenhower was very worried about what could happen. The founding fathers couldn't have anticipated this, was his comment to Haggerty. So who knew? The president thought he had so much in common with old Hickory, but it turns <laughs> out uh, perhaps it was Ike who was his real <laughs> emotional doppelganger. Doug, Could we be. thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Kennedy. Good to talk to you. Coming up, Paul Manafort's criminal trial. Well, that's starting today. It's the very first involving a target in this special counsel probe. We'll talk about what's at stake and what kind of impact the verdict will have on the wider investigation. That's next. It's not going to be very glamorous for Paul Manafort in jail. The trial for President Trump's former campaign manager, the aforementioned Mr. Manafort, got underway in Alexandria, Virginia today. And while there was plenty of talk about bank fraud and tax evasion, the one subject that didn't come up, Russian collusion. Prosecutors have called upon 35 witnesses to attest to Manafort's luxury spending habits, but the defense is arguing that Robert Mueller doesn't care about Paul Manafort's crimes and is simply squeezing him so he'll dish on the president. One thing that is clear, the stakes are incredibly high for both sides. Manafort facing up to 300 years in prison. Man, he's going to get old when he gets out. Mueller facing a damaging setback to the credibility of his probe if he's acquitted. It is a tangled web, but if anyone can unravel it, it is our next guest, criminal defense attorney, David Bruno. What do you know, Bruno? Tangle web we weave. Mm. Well, this is an uphill battle for Manafort's team, no doubt about it. And what they're doing is they're making this case about Rick Gates, the star witness for the government. Yeah. The, actually, Gates is the one that was dealing with Manafort's accountants. He was the one reviewing the tax returns mm -hmm. and approving them. So he's the scapegoat. That's going to be the out. That's the argument. And that's how they opened this today. Does he have immunity, Gates? And what kind of an immunity deal does he have with the government to have turned on his former partner, Paul Manafort? Okay, well, Gates was co-defendant with Manafort in this indictment. Mm -hmm. And if you read it, it basically says that Gates and Manafort worked hand in hand to commit all these crimes. He has agreed to a deal, so he still has jeopardy. I mean, there's no question about it. In his deal, he has agreed to potentially 57 months to 71 months. Mm. Now, based on his cooperation with the government, the government can decrease that all the way down to as little as probation. Wow. So we'll see. He's got every reason to cooperate, and he's got every reason to lie as well. All right, so who's your money on at this point? Just I, I know it, it's day one, but you, you say that the defense has... Uphill. Yeah. Absolutely. They're doing the right thing to attack Gates because he's the one that is cooperating. He's the one that has the reason to lie. However... Uh, in the indictment, it is alleged that there were foreign bank accounts in Cyprus and other foreign uh, countries, mm -hmm. and Paul Manafort was using money to pay for goods, services, real estate. Isn't that what we in the use States. money for? Yes, but you have to disclose it. Mm -hmm. You have to say that you have foreign accounts over ten thousand dollars, which they did not do. It's account in the indictment as well, mm -hmm. and you have to pay. But taxes. a lot of people do that. And you have to. I pay mean, taxes. That, that's part of the FATCA 
Act that was passed in 2012. Right, yeah. right. It says that if you have the foreign account, you have to disclose it to the IRS. Mm -hmm. Okay, they did not. So that's a problem for him. I think the biggest problem is going to be that he's using the money to buy real estate, personal real estate. He's using the money to buy $5,000 ostrich ja uh, jackets, Hot. jewelry, yes. cars. Break it down. Okay, so how is he going to say that he wasn't benefiting from the money and it wasn't his mm -hmm. when he used it? All right, yeah, so but that's a, a lot of people problem. would like nice things. Yes, and, but they pay taxes, yeah. and you have to under the law. Sure. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, but the United States is one of only a couple countries on earth that actually takes tax money when you've earned it in another country, which right. is kind of lame. But that is the law in the United States. Mm -hmm. If you're a U.S. citizen and you make it internationally, you still have to pay taxes in the U.S. I know. Isn't that insane? Nowhere else does that. It's, it's a really backwards law. It's, a, it's very interesting. That aside, what are the ramifications for the president if Paul Manafort is, in fact, found guilty? Z nothing. Zero. Politically? Right. Well, well, the indictment has nothing to do with the Trump campaign or Donald Trump. If anything, it is now, if he's found guilty and he's now facing the rest of his life in jail, he could potentially get out, mm -hmm. get a lesser sentence to and start cooperating. And these are all federal crimes? He could start cooperating. They're all federal crimes, yep. which means the president, the president can pardon, pardon at any time. Unreal. Right? Last day. You know, that will be perhaps the most entertaining one well one of the most entertaining moments of this presidency is the people he chooses to pardon on his way out the door david bruto pardon me for not giving you more time but we got to go we're up always a pleasure break. very good to see you, you. uh he's going to keep an eye on this trial for us topical storm is next day right here a Thai man was arrested for faking his death on Facebook so he could con his family out of funeral expenses it's a shocking story because most people are faking their lives on Facebook. <laughs> Get with the program, because this is the topical storm, and yes, they're real. Topic number one. We begin tonight in France, where the World Cup celebrations have ended, but one fan is still flying high. Oh, look at that! That's hoverboard master Frankie Zapata. And no, he's not a Marvel Comics superhero. We know this because if he were, this movie would have at least five sequels by now. He's also not a DC comic superhero, because if he were, this video wouldn't be any good. And if you don't believe me, ask anyone who's seen Batman vs. Superman. You ruined everything, Ben Affleck! The turbojet hoverboard is not yet available to the public, because although the idea of having one sounds really cool, they still haven't found a way to pay for them yet. It's basically the Bernie Sanders of hoverboards. The 1% get all the good hoverboards! I'd rather play shuffleboard anyway! Oh, where's my nap? Topic number two. <laughs> he misplaced it. It's tough. Let's head down to San Antonio. Woo! Where the aquarium at night is big and bright. These two maniacs stole a two foot long horn shark out of a petting tank. Sounds like my prom night. And if you ask me, the real maniac was whoever put a shark in a petting tank to begin with. That'll be great for the kids. Why not throw in an electric eel and a few piranhas, too? Fortunately, the shark was recovered a few hours later after police found it in the basement of the Alamo. It was right next to my bike! One man has been arrested for the theft, and if he's found guilty, he'll get sent where all criminals in Texas go to the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Yay! Topic number three. Anyone who watches this show on a regular basis, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, well, they, they will tell you that we've been doing way too many bear stories lately, but don't worry. Pretty soon the NFL playoffs will be here in the whole country. We'll be talking about the bears. Until then, check out this fella. Oh no! He's so cute and ferocious! He got caught in a, he was trapped in a Colorado storm drain. <laughs> he was looking for food. <laughs> Don't feel bad for him. Feel bad for the guy who was doing repairs inside the manhole. I'm just kidding. I didn't mean to say the word manhole. I know that's not very woke of me. I meant to say people hole. Forgive me, Justin Trudeau. And Justin Trudeau, while you're at it, forgiving me, go shut your manhole. The bear has since retreated to the woods where we're happy to report that after seeing this video, a good Samaritan brought him some food. Mm. <laughs> Do you like fish, buddy? They brought it all the way from San Antonio. 
That had to set him back a couple of fins. You should hear my God bless America. It's very humbling. Topic number four. A California family found two mountain lions on their... A lot of animal stories tonight. You're a naturist. I can see you, and you're not wearing pants. Mm. On their doorstep this week, so naturally, they called the cops, but not before getting rid of all the drinking straws in their home, because heaven forbid you get caught with straws in California. They'd wish the lions got to them before the cops did. You buy the ring doorbell because it comes with a camera that shows you who's outside, you know, in case it's somebody and never one on your property, like a burglar or someone far more dangerous, like a democratic socialist. A burglar will at least let you keep some of your money. Yeah. The lions eventually ran back into the woods, but wildlife officials believe they were drawn to the house by the smell of the family's pet cats. Oh, so putrid. Just when I thought there weren't any more reasons to own a stupid cat. They're the worst. Dear Kennedy, Mr. Jiggles is a great fan. Topic number five. <laughs> Smells like dead ass. Finally, we head down to Austin, Texas, where a man did the unthinkable. No, he didn't get Stephen Colbert to tell a funny Trump joke, but he did try to rob a store in Texas without a gun. Huh. 44-year-old David Garcia Gonzalez allegedly tried to rob a Whataburger with a pair of salad tongs. Police believe he may have been drunk because Austin. Booze comes out of the drinking faucets in that town. Yeah, even on your drunkest day, you got to know better than to rob a Texas store without a gun. He's lucky he didn't get shot by someone's great-grandma. Garcia Gonzalez was arrested and charged with robbery by threat, and the restaurant has seized his vehicle, and they're now using it to make deliveries. The only year. Thank you so much for watching the best hour of your day. Tomorrow we're back at our normal time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 in the West, with Greg Gutfeld, Kaylee McEnany, and Matt Welch. Find me at Kennedy Nation. I'll find you in my dreams. Good night.